very good morning, everyone. My name is Gareth Jenkinson. I'm uh, a journalist and broadcaster from South Africa. I've been working in the cryptocurrency space for a little over seven years as a writer for Cointelegraph. I now work for them full time uh, for over a year now. And it's a great pleasure to be hosting this panel this morning. Um, as the title suggests, uh, fiat on-ramps uh, remain a crucial first step in onboarding uh, new users for crypto-native businesses in particular. And of course, the world is uh, still predominantly fiat-based and uh, having pay payment rails and uh, banking services that cater to the cryptocurrency uh, sector remains a big hurdle. And this panel features three individuals that are working exclusively in this space and they'll be unpacking the landscape, its current state, and the many challenges that it faces. So I think we'll start from the left and, and let you all introduce yourselves and chat a little bit more about the companies that you work for and what they do because they, they are very integral in this, this space in particular. Right, first of all, very good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Jana and I'm the chief executive of OpenPaid. As I said earlier, I feel that uh, being surrounded by all of that innovation, uh, I represent the boring side of things, the traditional side of things. Um, in a nutshell, OpenPaid is a regulated financial institution. We are an EMI in the UK as well as in Europe. And really the core of our offering is banking and payments infrastructure for amongst other industries, the, uh, the crypto industry vertical. So we really specialize uh, in helping many of the people that I see around the room and as well as on, on, on that panel, bring payments through bank transfers, through virtual IBANs, as in traditional fiat money into their systems to really power the innovation that uh, they take care of onward. So that's us in a nutshell. Samuel. Good morning, Samuel Rondo. I'm the managing director at Damex in Gibraltar. We are a regulated DLT license since 2018. We are a specialist of uh, on and off ramp for higher risk category of client. We attend to iGaming, Forex, family office, and hedge funds. Basically, uh, we convert very large amount of crypto to fiat or fiat to crypto. We, have, uh, we can serve three currencies, uh, euro, sterling, and dollars. And uh, we've been uh, uh, transacting over $2 billion last year. Uh, so we are the first step into the crypto world and the last step out of it. Shimon Zivnevich, uh, co-founder and CEO of Rump Network. Um, Rump Network is a single API access platform to um, the worldwide um, fiat system. Uh, you can implement our API or SDK into your app and get access um, to a regulatory and uh, compliance and tech setup that allows your users to buy and sell crypto all across the world. Um, we are um, wide worldwide. Uh, we are headquartered in the UK, but we also have entities in Brazil, US, um, Ireland, and operate across APAC as well. The value proposition is um, for companies that are building retail crypto products um, to plug in our platform and offer a much easier, much better way for their users to access crypto products with their credit cards, debit cards, local payment methods, uh, bank transfers. And the aim here is to make the transition to uh, crypto-enabled products so smooth and seamless that people would stop noticing uh, that they are now uh, interacting with an entirely new um, tech setup. So ideally, uh, for those of you who used uh, modern neobanks such as Revolut, um, it should uh, like getting into a crypto product should resemble topping up your uh, Revolut app and um, the system enabling it should be global because all of your web three products are global and this is what we are building. As a journalist working in the space since 2017, I've seen the evolution of uh, especially crypto companies really struggling to get banking partners and payment rails to service customers. And uh, it it's really is an interesting topic, especially for the sector. Um, I think for those that don't really understand why fiat on-ramping is important, maybe we can just unpack that very quickly just to understand why this is an integral part of driving adoption of cryptocurrencies around the world. Uh, Jana, maybe you can, you can go first. You guys work with uh, quite a few big players in the crypto space, crypto.com and the likes. 
Yeah, absolutely. So just, just to put things into perspective, today we process over 3 billion euro of volume on a monthly basis and we've issued over uh, 2 million accounts to different exchanges. Many of those exchanges are here with us on, on the floor. The reality is that there is a not just a level of mistrust, there is a growing and growing and growing level of mistrust on behalf of both regulators as well as traditional holders of access to payment rails, whether that's the SEPA network or it's the SWIFT network, whether you call them banks or systems that manage those payment rails in so far as the crypto world is concerned. And I guess fundamentally, at least at this stage, I believe that the mistrust is um, something that we can address very easily. And one of our jobs is to really try and help bridge that gap. Because fundamentally, if we can address the concerns around um, identity and traceability, ergo money laundering on the traditional side of things, I believe that we can bridge that gap. Now I'm going to leave it to the rest of the panel to explain why it is so important to bridge that gap in order to drive that, that mainstream adoption. But I believe that we cannot separate in between the two worlds. I believe that we need to work in collaboration to meet the standards. As someone said earlier on a different panel, we cannot go against the SEC. We, we should not go against the SEC. We should not go against the regulator, but rather try and address the main risks that are being raised as a concern in order to drive to drive that rapprochement, uh, as one would say in French. Samuel, for you. Yes, just taking a step back. Wh why are banks mostly allergic to crypto? And uh, we we deal every single day with clients which are having a reputational issue with our bank account because they want to interact with the crypto world. It's simply a, a misunderstanding of the tool and the principle. Um, so I think what the space is, is pivoting to is some specialist actor, which have the team in place, which have the understanding of how it works, of the AML process and so on. And, um, and then the, this activity is going to be separated uh, from, from the traditional bank. What is interesting is with actors like OpenPaid or, or others, um, they are definitely crypto friendly, so you can compartiment your activity with those actors. And then the, let's say you do a, a crypto to fiat payment within an IBAN that you got with OpenPaid or another actor, and then you move this money towards your main bank account, it's a completely different AML process. And the bank will not have a problem with that, even if they ask documentation about it, because the whole AML and due diligence process has been done before. So I think that's, that's what matters. We need to um, create some actors which are ultra specialists of the space uh, and create a seamless experience. I like what you say, it's just like, uh, you know, for users, it's very cumbersome and uh, we need to create this, this user uh, f um, agility and understanding the process. And then uh, it's only a matter of uh, getting in, in and out of the crypto world with it. So um, what was mentioned is very important. So it is very important to work hand in hand with regulators. Uh, as Yana said, it is very important to forge strong partnerships um, with banking partners and institutional partners. Um, but the wrapper of all that is great technology. And what we do at Ramp is to uh, broker this trust between uh, players in the ecosystem and use strong partnerships with players uh, like OpenPaid um, and maybe Damex in the future, and to create a product that is really delightful to use. I think that unramping is important because crypto is so powerful that it can be used for many things. Some of these things touch um, areas that are strongly regulated. However, we all hope that crypto would, would, would be used in areas that are more casual, more low key, like payments or maybe NFTs or um, uh, maybe cross border transactions and remittances. However, um, the way the regulation here is structured is that crypto is being treated as if it was uh, pretty much a um, mostly a security or investment uh, instrument. And as such, there are a lot of barriers one has to uh, overcome to be able to use crypto. 
And so if we want to bridge the gap and start using an instrument that is regulated as if it was uh, a financial instrument to uh, let people use it in casual situations, uh, we need to create a technology that allows people um, to comply with the regulatory requirements in a way that feels like you are uh, paying online as if you are using an e-commerce platform. And it is a big technological challenge because yes, you need to do KYC. Yes, you need screen your user. Yes, you need to do uh, AML checks. Um, and these are things that typically take uh, hours or even days when you get onboarded to brokerage uh, service. However, the user uh, uh, who is trying to buy an NFT or uh, do a cross-border transfer or something else that is very casual ex expects it to work just as if it would be an e-commerce payment. And so to bridge this gap um, requires all of us together to work very hard and like uh, we at RAMP try to be at the very forefront of this transformation. Um, and I think when we bridge this gap, we'd be able to unlock a lot of the uh, potential of Web3. So all of the things that we discuss all uh, over again, things that make sense in principle, but in practice do not make sense because of the friction. This is our mission. Gareth, if I may just add one more point, just building on, on what Shimon was saying there. I think 100% the, 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 the technology and the innovation within the, the from a technological standpoint is absolutely critical. But there is another aspect that I, I just want to emphasize on by giving one example, and that's the matter of conduct as well. Because I guess all the players here on, on the panel, they are effectively trying to do the right thing. Whether it's partnering with, um, whether it's beefing up their compliance regulatory understanding and expertise, whether it's developing the technology, it doesn't matter. What we also need to recognize, however, is that that mistrust that, that you were just talking about is driven by the fact that there are and there have been historically actors in the marketplace, very large actors in the marketplace, that were not necessarily striving to do the right thing. And I'll give you an example. In the not so long distant future, we were approached by a very, very large exchange. I'm not going to name names, but one of the, if not the biggest exchange to essentially adopt our payment rails and virtual IBAN solution. And we said, that's fine, but we want to see how your KYC and uh, control framework operates. And what we realized is that they would allow a user to load $2 million on a daily basis, and they would renew the $2 million limit every day without asking you ever, what is the source of the $2 million? Whereas based on our, at the time, I guess, rules and regulations, it was 20,000. And I'm just mentioning this to, to put things into perspective. And we simply could not, not reach an agreement on this point. And at that point, obviously, we as a business had to make a decision. Do we want to generate revenues very, very quickly or do we want to walk away? We made the decision to walk away. Well, not everyone else in the industry did. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is the conduct and I guess the values behind the development of a business are equally important to actually foster that environment of, of trust. I did want to just touch on um, the difference between being a banking partner and a payment rail because they are two fundamentally different things, but they, they're tied together. Obviously, open paid allows you to have digital IBANs, right? And then um, you guys are a payments rail. Um, how important or how difficult, firstly, is it for these cryptocurrency companies um, to get a banking account um, and why do they have to turn to a third party player like you in order to bridge the gap between a traditional bank and banking themselves because the banks at the moment are still like we don't want to touch this yeah that's 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 a very difficult question first of all just to be clear open paid is not servicing the crypto industry exclusively we service a lot of financial institutions uh, fx brokers gaming insurer tech and and, and others um, I wouldn't labor the point about regulation too much, but I guess one of the main challenges that we see is that the technology, the banking technology of incumbent banks does not really correspond to the level of innovation and the level of, of speed and agility that all of their products and customers require. Right, And that is one of the main reasons why players, infrastructure providers that can aggregate different payment rails, different banks, different channels actually exist because we can go to Shimon and give him a single API and allow him to 
get access to multiple countries, multiple jurisdictions, multiple currencies, and have an equivalent level of service and experience across, across the board. So the question is how difficult it is to get a bank account. It's less like uh, the first one is difficult. Second one is also difficult, but uh, you just need to make sure you don't lose them. So I think the, the point is, is, is the conversation between the partners. Um, there is few actors which are well known to service the crypto industry. I think their role is just to ensure that uh, all your function are, and your process are in place to make sure that you serve them, your client well and you respect the level of risk that you establish with them. Um, on any day, we can accept up to $100 million, but we're not going to do that blindly and uh, for any client. So I think what, what really matters is uh, to build this community and um, there's maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 actors in Europe which are known as uh, turn to wars and which are trying to build together. So I think events like this are super important for us to meet and to strengthen our own private network and work in and enhance. I think that's the key. The answer to the second question raised by Samuel, how hard it is to open a bank account, really, um, like the answer really depends on how specialized are you. And um, this is why Web3 companies choose to work us, with us because we are regulatory technology uh, specialists uh, effectively. So we are able to aggregate literally dozens of banking and payment provider partners across the world to bridge the gap between fiat and your audience. And we do that in a way where we onboard your users. So um, all the regulations uh, that you need to specialize um, in to be able to meet the requirements um, are fundamentally met by us because we facilitate the entire trade and then the user is able to take the crypto we send to them and uh, interact with your platform be it a wallet NFT uh, marketplace or uh, potentially like a new gen DeFi um, product the, the thing here is that um, it really doesn't make sense to build the pay and setup uh, all over again. So there is a space in, uh, in this industry for players who are going to aggregate and bridge the gap, build one platform and let dozens and dozens of Web3 products, exchanges and um, fintech products to build on top of it. So uh, this is ultimately the answer to be able to inspire that trust and uh, build these partnerships. Uh, you need to be a specialist. And to be a specialist, you basically need to focus on um, this particular activity only. Um, and Web3 companies are not built for this, and that's very good. But this is why they can partner up with companies like Ramp. Um, obviously, we don't want to harp on too long about regulation, but Europe is pretty progressive now with Mika coming into effect probably in 2024. Uh, looking back. Is it easier now to set up this kind of infrastructure than it was two or three years ago? And, and do you see more players like yourselves entering the market to service the industry? When you deal with a regulator, nothing is easy. <laughs> but you have some good regulators around, which are, again, it's a question of choosing the right partners. I think there is some jurisdiction which are grandfathered into Mika, meaning that the actual framework is already in place and the transition is going to be very smooth. Um, what is a concern is I do believe that in Europe there is multiple jurisdiction which are not playing the, the same game. Uh, so we have, you have some jurisdiction with a lot of uh, VASP authorization. Um, just a, a reminder that a VASP is just a, a registration with the, with the regulator that you trying to do things well, but there will be no control. So it's a, it's a very light view on regulation. It's a tick box. To, yeah, it's a tick box compared to a regulated entity, uh, which there is still very few around, uh, which you have to uh, regular audits on your function. So it's, it takes time. You have to explain the process and so on. So France is very advanced. Netherlands is very advanced. I would mention Malta and Luxembourg. Uh, island, I, I, I think, is also interesting, but uh, it's not everywhere. So I think this transition period is going to be very interesting 
Um, but things are not easier today than they will be in 12 months' time because we need Mika to be in place, to be implemented, to be uh, transposed in every single jurisdiction for us to be ready and to have a common. And I cannot wait uh, for this to happen just to have a, a common framework and a larger clan base to attend to. And if I may just add to that, I guess there is a second trend that we also need to recognize alongside Mika, and that is the fact that many of the large players, so if you take a Kraken, take a Crypto.com, take some of the really big exchanges, all of them are now actually moving towards becoming electronic money institutions in their own right. Many of them are effectively thinking about mainstream credit institutional licenses, as in thinking about becoming a bank. So I think this is one trend to, to follow. And then obviously building on the back of what you both said and what Shimon said earlier, if you as a business do not have sufficient expertise, sufficient resources to meet the ever-growing compliance requirements, then I would strongly recommend find the right partner like, Ramp, like, well, like others to actually help you meet meet those obligations because the bar is, is, is constantly raising and, and I don't think that this is going to stop. Shimon, maybe you can just touch on um, the way forward, how you see uh, being a payments rail improving. Uh, is it a case of financial institutions just becoming more educated on the cryptocurrency landscape and, and regulators just becoming more accepting? I think it all boils down to experience and uh, uh, specializing. And I think that uh, a couple of years ago, there were no set standards. And today, there are standards that people feel very comfortable um, about. And this is mainly what's driving um, more favorable approach and product development on the financial institutions side. Uh, and I think this trend is only going to continue because there is a lot of uh, very good improvement uh, in that area. I don't even, I, I don't know if people realize, but um, massive amounts of money and development time were invested across the industry uh, into compliance. My own company spent three or four quarters um, building uh, out our compliance frameworks and platform uh, exclusively uh, in preparation for our global expansion to New York and to comply with Mika as well. Um, and I, 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 I would guess that many other companies uh, invested similar amounts of um, resources uh, to match highest compliance standards. And I think very soon compliance standards applied and expected from crypto companies are going to match very closely and in certain areas even um, you know, outgrow uh, what is expected from traditional payment uh, institutions. And this is a global trend that uh, is unavoidable. Um, and I think that you know, pendulum has swung. Uh, the um, market uh, responded very strongly by tightening up and investing more into these frameworks. And I think this is going to create a lot of trust and goodwill um, in the coming years and is going to be a very good fundament for um, the entire industry to grow. Just, just one word, if I may. Um, we've been talking a lot about uh, on-ramp which is uh, you send uh, a transfer from your bank account or you pay with a credit card to buy crypto assets. Um, this is very easy. That is no headache. The AML trace has been done by a prior institution and uh, this is the easy world. So everybody going into the world of crypto have a fantastic time and a, usually a great experience. Where it's become really tricky is the other way around. So if you're blessed and using the same actor, um, you're buying some Bitcoin, you're going to sell the Bitcoin with the same actor. There's a trace that's kind of okay. But as soon as you are touching millions and you are settling crypto that you receive for the purpose of processing and you want to sell this, this is really where the drama starts. And this is where things become really hectic and, and crazy. And I think this is really where the, the banking generally industry has a, has a deep misunderstanding about the tools and so on. Um, so, yes, there is a lack. So, blockchain is a perfect AML tool, but it's the perfect AML tool in the right hands and with the right people to understand it. You have the full trace of the coin on the blockchain, which is fantastic, but if you have a user which is telling you a different story than the one that the blockchain is saying, you have a problem. And this is where you, as users, you need to 
keep the documentation and I know you've been in crypto because you want the freedom, because you want to keep things a little bit more private and so on. But unfortunately, that concept doesn't reconcile well at all with the necessity of having to cash out at some point. And um, so keep the trace, keep the information, keep the, uh, the, the, the story in line with what the blockchain is going to show and the experience is going to be much better for everyone. But the only problem we have is off ROM, is never on ROM. Just wanted we to can help you with that. <laughs> Let's talk after. Uh, just by way of an example, I was chatting to uh, one of the co-founders of XRP Ledger, and he told me a story about trying to get finance um, to buy a house in America a few years ago. And he'd been working um, as a developer for a very long time, and he earned some Bitcoin um, working, uh, basically uh, doing some bug bounties for the Bitcoin community in early 2012, 2013. So he'd earned this Bitcoin and eventually he wanted to sell that Bitcoin and turn it into fiat so that he could pay for the house. And the bank was like, no, where did you get this Bitcoin from? We, we, need, to, we need to find out what the source of the funds was. He had to go back and, you know, on the way back machine <laughs> and prove that he had actually solved these bug bounties and earned this Bitcoin and provide them all the, the, the contract addresses to, you know, to provide the paper trail to say that this is where the Bitcoin came from. It's legitimate. And then he got his money and he bought the house. So it, it is quite difficult. I, I think just as a last question, it does seem like from the outside looking in, the responsibility is now on third party players like yourselves to do the due diligence when it comes to serving uh, especially cryptocurrency facing businesses. Is that the case? I mean, you just gave the example of saying to one exchange that was accepting 2 million every day, like, whoa, guys, sorry, we, we can't actually do business with you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the, the responsibility ultimately lies with all of the players within the ecosystem. A great word was used earlier, community. It's about building that community and each player has, has a part. From our perspective, it's a combination of having the right technology as well as the right expertise of the regulatory environment and the implications of it that are helping guide our customers on, on that journey. Samuel? Yeah, um, I don't have really a position on it. Shimon? <laughs> it's all about technology. So um, obviously to bridge the gap in a way that is um, acceptable for regulators and meets their requirements and at the same time gives users experience that they need and expect. Um, it is all about building frameworks and technology uh, that is going to bridge the gap. And we are still um, on this journey. And I think this problem is going to get solved quite soon, but we are not quite there yet. And this is why we need to push as the entire industry to build the technology, then uh, get the trust we need um, from players who are not always technology first and then use that to be able to offer delightful experiences and unlock Web3. Fantastic. Shimon, Samuel, Iana, thank you very much for your time. Uh, a round of applause for our panelists today. Thank you.